Greetings and welcome to the Richard Dolan Show, where every week we fight the good fight. Very excited about this week's program. I have a guest who is an author and a friend of mine and a colleague named Jack Roth. Jack is a journalist. He's a documentary film producer. In fact, uh, I had the pleasure of being in two of those, uh, I believe. And he's also the author of uh, several works of nonfiction. Uh, the main um, documentary films that he's known for, I guess, would be the three-part extraordinary series, uh, the last two of which, The Seeding and Revelations, I was uh, fortunate to be part of. Uh, that's a great series, by the way, on the UFO phenomenon and, and encounters and abductions and, and everything related. And he's the author of a book, I didn't know about this, The Ghost Soldiers of Gettysburg, and then another book called Unknown Down, which is about uh, unexplained phenomena. He's a, a great guy, fascinating person. I've had many conversations with him. And this book that he has written is called Killing Kennedy. Uh, I just want to show a picture of it right here. Great cover. He's got Cyril Wept doing the forward, a legend. And we're going to talk all about that. But Jack, it is a pleasure to have you. Welcome to the program. Thanks, Richard. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And by the way, we were honored to have you in those films. <laughs> so oh, well, was, you was, always add an incredible element and perspective to to everything that we're trying to do and trying to share with people. So, well, thank you. Uh, I appreciated that. You you guys were awesome. I love being part of it, and uh, I thought they were really successfully done. Thank you've you. got the, you've got this great book on the Kennedy assassination, which you sent me an advanced uh, PDF copy uh, some months ago. It's unique because if I just may uh, start with this, th there's lots of books on the killing of Kennedy. I mean, the Kennedy assassination strikes me as this this one of these open wounds, this unresolved trauma of American and even really world history, it's because it's one of these things where. Most of us at this point know that there were there was cover up conspiracy involved. And yet even now, all these years later, uh, our official government doesn't allow us really to have an honest conversation about it. And so it's this trauma that doesn't go away. But what you did is uh, something I think it's unique. I don't know of any other author that's done this. And you conducted detailed conversations with a number of Kennedy assassination experts and got their take on uh, a lot of philosophical issues. It seems to me that's how it affected American society, world society. And I really hope we can get into that. Um, what is it? What was your take on, um, or what was it that got you doing the Kennedy assassination to begin with? I didn't know that you had a huge uh, drive for that, but it's obvious in the book. Yeah. Um, and of course, you know me with the U the UFO stuff and, and those kinds of documentaries. And but I've always been fascinated with the Kennedy assassination because I think, well, certainly in 1990, almost like everyone else, they watched Oliver Stone's JFK and oh, yeah. whoever saw that film really got ratched up. Right. <laughs> I mean, just absolutely. There was just so much there to explore. And but even before that, I'd always to me. uh Jack Ruby shooting Lee Harvey Oswald right there is the red flag of all red flags. Something's rotten in the state of Denmark. <laughs> I mean, as a critical thinker, that's all you need to know. <laughs> that's all you need to know is that Ruby shot Oswald. I and mean, then there's Ruby in prison saying they injected <laughs> me with cancer, which they probably did. And then, and then they killed the one person who interviewed him there, Dorothy Kilgallen. Let's yes. just, you know, finish that whole sentence, right? I mean, there's so many ways to go, but that, that's a great question because why this book? And and it's a great story because I was talking to a friend of mine who lives in England, and I think you may know him because he's written a couple of books about ET hybrids and stuff. His name is Miguel Mendonca. Um, uh, I, yes, I believe I know who he is, and I think we may have com communicated. Yes, and uh, it's a great guy, smart guy, and we were talking – and we started having these long conversations about the Kennedy assassination. And I said, you know, I'd love to write a book about it. And, and then he's like, you know what, though, if you were going to write a book, what kind of book would you write that's different than the thousands of books that have exactly. already been written? Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, you're right, because I'm not going to I'm not going to be solving anything that hasn't either. Not that anything's been solved, but 
there have been researchers who have done 30, 40, 50 years of research on this. There have been people who have done the deep dives. And, and then I thought to myself, we kept coming up with like these phrases kept coming up, ripple effects, uh, why it still matters, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, the cost of conspiracy, like these, these higher level kind of things that were, you know, just a broader look at it. And, and, you know, and especially why it still matters today, why we should still care. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know what, this is the journey. This, I think that might be a good idea. It's almost a people's history. I'm going to interview you know, as many people as I can without being too many for a book. I mean, I wound up interviewing 30 people and 24 are in the book and, um, they, the others might be in another book. I don't, I'm not sure yet, but mm -hmm. uh, again, there's so much out there, but what I wanted to do is I wanted to create this journey for readers and I, and interview people from different areas. Uh, like you had mentioned, there are one, one sections on researchers, guys who have committed decades of their life to researching yeah. certain aspects of the, these guys get into the nitty gritty, right? Who shot from, the grassy knoll, like, you know, they, they look at the Zabruder tape, like through this exactly. magnifying glass and, and that's not really who I am anyway. I, I and I said, you know what, I'm just, I'll talk to them, but I also wanted to get different perspectives. So I talked to, there's four people in the book, uh, whose fathers were in the CIA at the time. And I was fortunate enough, very fortunate to be able to get people like St. John Hunt, Mm -hmm. who is the, the son of E. Howard Hunt and yeah. of Water, Watergate fame and also JFK assassination infamy uh, and and talking to those people all together. Peter Janney, whose father was Worcester Janney. I mean, this is these are incredible stories. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Peter Janney and his work, Mary's Mosaic, which is a classic of its own. I was lucky to have some conversations with Peter probably about a decade ago about all of this. And he's a fascinating guy too. So I'm just he, he is, and that. he's and it was great because we were just with him up in Boston and D.C. shooting footage for what could be our next documentary on that story. Excellent, uh, and which is really one of those things that happens when you go go down these paths, right? Other doors open up, and these all the rabbit holes. Out. <laughs> exactly right, and it has with us too. So I know, I know, we're still we're still dabbling with the uh, the whole uh, Laurel Canyon counterculture thing but uh you know there's great stories out there and they're all great stories but anyway getting back to that so uh you know i i was able to one at a time cultivate relationships with people and then one person would say you need to talk to that person uh -huh. you need to talk to that person and then on my own i figured you know what i need to talk to some academics i want to talk to some phds some people who teach classes or teach at universities and i wanted to get a psychological perspective uh, a, a social science perspective, a, uh, even I, I, I spoke to a philosophy professor and that was a fascinating interview. I said, what, what are the philosophical aspects of this? I mean, how do we look at the Kennedy assassination from a philosophical standpoint? So what amazed me more than ever in doing this, I interviewed 24 people all together and some of them had known Oswald. There were, there's a section in there on that. There's a section where I interviewed people. They were all in new Orleans or did research on New Orleans in the summer of 63. And New Orleans in the summer of 1963 is probably one of the most fascinating places and times in American history. So Absolutely. That That's where all the action was happening. It's where really all the background to the assassination occurred. Right. And, and Oliver Stone was, didn't exaggerate that in the movie. That was real. I mean, that obviously, you know, that's why Garrison did what he did. So mm -hmm. there were a lot of players there and there were a lot of connections made that really, so here's, you have this huge hundred thousand piece puzzle and people are trying to put the entire puzzle together. So I figured, well, if I can just add my own few pieces and I just wanted to offer something to this field and say, let me here. Well, yeah. I, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, That's okay. What do you, what is, how would you look at the JFK assassination from like a psychological or philosophical perspective? Okay. Well, for example, and this is where it gets really interesting. Like the, the psychologist talked a lot about, cause the questions I asked were each, I asked the same questions, the same big theme questions to everyone. What are the ripple effects? Why does it still matter? But then depending on the chat person, I asked specific questions. Mm -hmm. And so the psychologists like, you know, they started talking about things like cognitive dissonance, 
um, country as father, uh, all of these psychological terms that have to do with, because I would ask, why do you think that so many people did hook, line, and sinker believe the Warren Commission, or even if they didn't believe the Warren Commission report, didn't want to go there? They did. It was too uncomfortable not to believe the Warren Commission report. Exactly. And, you know, this is this goes to the UFO field. This goes to all of that. And it's like people don't want to go too far out of their paradigm because it really can mess them up. It, it's human nature. And I learned a lot about human nature from this book that really, if I feel like for me, I, I would say the human nature aspects of, of things. Uh, and how it applies to American history and also Oswald were the two most shocking things. But so, and philosophically he talked about, well, if we look at it, this a thousand years from now, you know, so he started mm -hmm. talking, you know, mm -hmm. like, you know, how philosophy is, but it's the idea that, you know, one of the things that he actually, uh, he talks about in his class that he teaches, he also talks about conspiracy theory, but he talks about how, Again, that's been twisted, uh, and I make sure to talk about that in the book. Uh, I, I, I explain very clearly. I use Webster dif Dictionary definitions of conspiracy, cover-up, uh, and corruption because the point of it was not all conspiracy theories are created equal. I'm not writing right. a book saying the earth is flat. Uh, the Kennedy assassination is a critical thinker's conspiracy theory that's even more that's really more than a theory i mean it's pretty much like you know I, I think if you're a critical thinker and you're objective you can come to the conclusion that there was definitely it wasn't just oswald whether you believe oswald did it or didn't do it or was involved or wasn't it was definitely not just him so yeah and this is just based on doing your own research and again being a critical thinker so well, I'm going to ask you, because I don't think Oswald did it at all. I actually, I, yeah. I do not believe that Lee, Harvey, Lee Harvey Oswald was, a uh, was on the trigger with that at all. Uh, I think he was completely set up. That's my opinion, but I know I'm not alone with that opinion. Um, I would like to ask you, so, uh, cause you, you raise a lot of points. You, you talk about Oswald. I would love to ask you about misconceptions about Oswald. Um, Maybe I jumped ahead with this idea about philosophical perspectives. Let's back up. And what were some of the ripple effects of the Kennedy assassination? Because it really just seemed to have done bad things, uh, certainly to the United States. It, it just, as I was saying before, I think it, it was like a trauma. It's this unresolved trauma. And I think it just messed us up uh, in, in a lot of ways. What, what do you see as some of the ripple effects of the Kennedy assassination? Well, what I learned, and almost to a person, the people I interviewed believe this in some way, shape, and form, and they they expressed it a little differently, but it all it all meant the same. And this it was that up until 1963, there was this strong sense of American exceptionalism, which was mm -hmm. actually a phrase used. You know, we right. were the cat's meow from World War II through the early 1960s. We were it. We were the guiding light. We were the, you know, the Statue of Liberty, right? Bring With five percent of the here. world's five percent of the world's population, fifty percent of the world's wealth at the end of World War II. It's incredible. I mean, it was, it, yeah, yeah. It was an ultimately untenable. You couldn't be maintaining that forever, but America tried. Uh, it, was, <laughs> it was a stated goal, actually, to try to maintain that as long as possible. It was, and but what people did know is. I would say certainly even before World War II, but you can you can look at World War II and what happened right after as the beginning of some very nefarious things that began to happen that started to break down uh, what you would call that American exceptionalism. But when Kennedy was killed, it was such a, uh, it, it, I would say, you know, if you look at that, the fact that he was killed the way he was in public, uh, it, it, the gall it took to do something like that, totally uh, shocking. Uh, totally shocking. Yeah, and, yeah. but what, what people refer to is that as soon as, as soon as that happens, Kennedy is killed. What happens? What Johnson goes in the office from that moment on, it's a, everything starts to deteriorate, <laughs> including the substance of men who became president. 
And if you look at it, you say, okay, well, we got Johnson. Who wanted Johnson? No one wanted Johnson, but we got Johnson. The man was a criminal, right. in my opinion. Uh, there's a the chapter on that yeah. that will blow your mind. <clears throat> I mean, I, I can't. Uh, and again, I'm just, I'm documenting all this. I wasn't there. I wasn't with his, you know, in the 50s, 40s and 50s when he was working his way through the Texas good old boy network. Mm -hmm. But boy, if there's a criminal in all this, he's close to the top of the list. Now, I'm not saying he was, you know, I would never say he was the guy that, you know, the mastermind behind the Kennedy assassination, because I don't think he was, but he was certainly a good person to have in place <laughs> for something like that to happen. Agreed. Uh, you know, and uh, so anyway, so yeah, you, you, you look at, you start looking at, you have Johnson and then you have Nixon. Then you have Ford who, you know, Mr. Uh, Warren commission guy, yeah. Yep. Uh, what a what a government shill that guy was, and you just have to you know face the facts of who these people were. Ford also, I think, was a three or or four three time Bilderberg attendee. He's one of those. He was actually, it's, it's, he was like you know uh, a made man in Goodfellas. He's like Joe Pesci, <laughs> maybe not as violent as Pesci, but like you get you become made when you, be, you attend those Bilderberg meetings. Like you're you you're in, you're in. All of these guys Ford was a team player. And that's why people thought people in this country thought the president was the pinnacle of not only power, but respectability, honor. You know, there was, again, this Absolutely. American exceptionalism, you know, even though there's some might not have been. I mean, mm -hmm. they were all, you know, for the most part, they they held that office pretty well. And what people didn't realize is that and they realized this with the Kennedy assassination is like, oh, yeah, the president really doesn't have very much power. And then you start looking behind the scenes and think, of, well, the CIA had a lot more power than he did. Mm -hmm. You know, people like yeah. uh, the Rockefellers had a lot more power, the the oil magnets, the all of these incredibly. And what kept coming up is elite elitism, elitism. These I think you're elite. right. I think I think uh, that that moment, November 22nd, 1963, is, is a really um, incredibly powerful dividing point, uh, not just in. Uh, American history, but like in our, in our understanding of ourselves, because it really did kind of, even before the Vietnam War ripped um, open American society, Western society, uh, that assassination, I think was the, was the moment where it really started to unravel. And it was the beginning of the Vietnam War, basically. That's right. Yeah. Because it yeah, is well, true what they say. Johnson, yeah. uh, you know, we have Gulf, Gulf of Tonkin and uh, what was it? Operation Rolling Thunder. That uh, essentially kicked off the, the massive escalation in Vietnam shortly after Kennedy was was taken out. Um, what about Lee Harvey Oswald, incidentally? Um, do, do you think I'm right in thinking Oswald wasn't wasn't a trigger man? Or I mean, do you have an opinion on this? Or what what, what do we what do people think about Oswald that is that's wrong in your opinion? One of the things I really wanted to accomplish with the book was to provide a better understanding of who Oswald was as a person not only as either a lone nut assassin mm -hmm. or a patsy, whatever you thought, we only know him as either. He was, yeah. he was either a deranged lone nut guy loner, or he was a patsy who was set up, but who was Lee Harvey Oswald? Who was he? And I think one of the greatest gifts that I received in doing this book was learning, really learning who he was by talking to people who knew him, and people who knew uh, a lot more about him. And uh, for example, uh, I interviewed a, a young girl who was a, a 11 years old at the time of the assassination. And she, her grandmother owned the boarding house where Oswald was staying when the assassination happened. Uh -huh. And I was able to talk to her, but she told a few stories to me. And, she, and what she said was, I had two older brothers. They were like 12 and 14 or whatever. And they used to have a lot of borders. They were all men. So the men would border there and they'd come and go over time and whatever. And she said, Lee was the only, they used to call Mr. Lee. And Mr. Lee was the only person who took time to actually spend time with my brothers, play with them, talk to them, treat them like human beings. Mm -hmm. Because back then adults, a lot of the attitude was, you know, just be seen, but not heard. I mean, you just, you know, you were kids and get out of my way. Even fathers were like that, 
This is just the way it was. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and 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 <laughs> Lee Harvey Oswald was not like that. And they tell the story about how the brothers got into a fight on the front lawn and Lee took them, sat them on each side of him on the porch and started telling them how important brothers were to each other. And then they couldn't fight, never fight that they were, they, you know, they should love each other. And the brothers was like a, this bond that they should have. Wow. And she would, and she sat there and was just like, wow. Like, and when it happened, when it, when the assassination happened, she, they none of them could believe it. The brothers were devastated, devastation. The Mister Lee would never do that. Blah blah blah. It just listen. Mm -hmm. I was. I tell people I wasn't there. I wasn't on the grassy knoll that day. I wasn't on the sixth floor. I'm not telling you who did it, who didn't, because I wasn't there. I don't know. And most probably, we'll never know exactly what happened. But what I can provide to people is this better understanding of who Lee Harvey Oswald, the man, was. And he was really intelligent. He was very well read. All he did was read books. Anyone who knew him, he was always reading, whether it's newspapers, books. He was read, read, read. And he had dyslexia as a kid. So he worked through it on his own. And uh -huh. he was a sensitive human being. He was mm -hmm. a brilliant human being, but he was, he was also a patriot. Like his big thing was he was, you know, he wanted to be in the military. He wanted to be part of that. Exactly. And so he loved being, he was, he was an, uh, he was an intelligence asset, the U S intelligence asset. Yes, exactly. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> the defects to Russia, to the Soviet <laughs> union, uh, gets nothing out of that experience except, I guess, a wife. We can bring back Marina <laughs> with him. Uh, the Soviets weren't dumb. They they kind of knew. You know, yeah. the Soviet Union was a big black hole for American intelligence in a lot of ways in the late 50s. Uh, Stalin had died, but there's this new guy, Khrushchev, he's running things. And uh, it, it seemed evident that America's intelligence community was having was struggling to get inside information. So I think it was like from 1945 to 1955, I think there were like zero defections to the Soviet Union. And then uh, around Oswald's time, there were quite a few, and he was one of them. So it clearly seems like an op on America's part. One that failed, uh, he gets sent back and uh, now becomes this uh, so-called communist hanging out in the streets of New Orleans. And, you know, uh, Oliver Stone portrayed this very nicely, I thought, in the JFK movie over 30 years ago. Uh, where he's got the hands off Cuba leaflets he's passing out while he's also sharing an office with a different address, but the same office as Guy Bannister uh, of the FBI, who I think was slightly to the right of Benito Mussolini politically, you know, this arch conservative, hardcore anti-communist. And here is Oswald sharing an office under a different address in New Orleans. Obviously, it's an op. Obviously, right. this is an option. Being sheep dipped like no one's ever been yeah. sheep dipped before. And and here's an interesting, I'll tell you a couple other things that I learned from doing the book. I interviewed a guy and he's in the last part of the book. It's keeping the story alive. And he actually does a tour in New Orleans and specializes. He does a couple other kinds of history tours, but he does a Lee Harvey Oswald tour. Mm -hmm. And it just focuses on Lee Harvey Oswald Wald and his movements in that summer and what happened that summer. And I interviewed him for the book. And then uh, last year, my wife and I, just for a three-day weekend over the winter, uh, we, we like to go to New Orleans because the weather's nice and we love New Orleans. So we went there for, and I called him and, uh, and he said, yeah, come on. You know, I could, I said, can you, I know it's last minute, but can you do a tour in the morning? I, you know, we'll pay you. He goes, I'll do it. You know, private tour for free. And we, it, it was probably one of the most amazing experiences of my life because he starts, he goes, okay. One thing you are going to learn in this tour, New Orleans is an extremely small town. And if one thing happens here, the person over here is going to know about it. And then he starts the tour. And it's just like the scene in the movie where Costner is taking his guys and he's like, you see that right there? Exactly. Yeah. The Naval Intelligence. You see that right there? CIA. You see that right there? FBI. Boom, boom. And it literally... When you're there and you're seeing the buildings, oh, and by the way, Guy Bannister's office, which is which is no longer there, but they have a sign. They have it is like a plaque. I mean, it's a it, you know where it is, uh -huh. and it's it's right there. It's right there. Then you walk one block, and it's Riley Coffee Company, which is where Oswald worked. 
That was his cover that they gave him. Exactly. Right next to the parking lot where all the FBI and CIA guys parked, where Oswald was seen going in there and chatting with people all the time. He knew all the guys. But when you see how small, <laughs> you think city, oh, city. You know, well, it's spread out. It's big. It's mind boggling. And then you go three blocks, two blocks or three blocks the other way down. And then you're where he was handing out the pamphlets. Yeah, it's incredible. That's I'm so glad you uh, <laughs> described all of that for uh, us because it's just a good reminder. You know, he's like in the heart, the belly of the beast okay, belly of, of the, the beast. entire U.S. intelligence community. And uh, yeah, he's just going to hand out Procastro leaflets. No biggie. <laughs> going to hang out with Guy Bannister. And that doesn't mean anything. Uh, there's there's yeah. nothing uh, subterranean going on here. And, and uh, you know, after his assassination, we just went through this whole game of pretend. Like, oh, yeah, we're going to pretend that he's actually this lone gunman who just wanted to kill Kennedy. It's absurd. But uh, there was, you know, no ability, really, or very limited ability for Americans to challenge this publicly. Uh, who's going to challenge the Warren Commission, which, by the way, was a total sham of investigation. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we're, you know, 30 years before the Internet. There's really no ability for people to do significant independent research. And then, of course, uh, you mentioned conspiracy theory in the beginning of this conversation. I'm just going to remind people listening. Uh, the phrase conspiracy theory, in my view, arguably was really created by the CIA in a 1967 memo, which is very well known, it's out in the open, in which they're talking about the, the problems of alternative views of the Kennedy assassination that were, you know, 1967, it's only three, four years removed from the whole thing. And there were already alternative non-establishment um, opinions about that. And the CIA has got this memo, like, well, how can we deal with this? And we'll use our assets in the media to smear these people, That's that's a given. And uh, we'll have them labeled as, we'll talk about these as conspiracy theories as a way to discredit them. And I don't know if that's the invention of the phrase, but it's definitely the moment in which that phrase started to have some real legs in our, our discourse, which it's never lost. Uh, you have all these mainstream people today using that phrase. And little do they know, this makes me sound like a conspiracy theorist, but the fact is they're literally doing the work of the CIA when they use that phrase. Right. But that to it, say it, that makes me a conspiracy theorist, which is just insane. It, it it's all are. it's real when you think about it, it's brilliant on the CIA's part. And they totally. were really good at what they did and and still are. But the, when it came to propaganda and psychological warfare, boy, they were the best probably ever on this planet. And mm -hmm. it, it and that was part of it. And that's why I I, I spend a lot of time in the introduction. I wasn't going to write the book unless I could explain in the introduction that not all conspiracy theories are created equal and what yeah. we're really talking about here. Okay. And then we need to get over that as basic conspiracy. If, if, if more than one person was involved in killing Kennedy, it was a conspiracy. That's right. <laughs> and, and based on the Webster's you know, dictionary definition and the cover up comes after so the cover up is covering it up. I'm glad you made that distinction because we often use those words uh, kind of as the same thing, but they're not the same. They're not, they're not the, the same, same thing. Yeah. And I've thought about this with you with UFOs, UAP, UAPs, mm -hmm. whatever now they call. <laughs> and it's the same thing. The, the existence of USO, UFOs or not isn't a conspiracy theory. Mm -hmm. The cover up is the conspiracy. Yeah, the, right, the, co right, the cover right, right. up. Did, whether if someone sees a, a, you, the fact that people have been seeing these strange objects in the sky and mm -hmm. uh, reporting these things and has its history and as you've well documented, that's not a conspiracy. The conspiracy has to come in one or more people trying to conspire to their own ends, taking that right and then mm -hmm. covering it up. In this case, they're using it to for all those years, right? Cover it up. The, the people, the regular people cannot know about this. They well, yeah, in, the, in the case of UFOs, the, you could say the cover up may is the conspiracy in a sense. With Kennedy, though, the conspiracy are the actual machinations behind the scenes to kill, to kill the Correct. president. And then uh, the cover up, which followed on the heels of it, which has now gone for almost 60 years.
Right. Really and corruption goes through all of it. And, and this is where human nature comes in. And mm-hmm. what I learned about human nature, because when people start they do their homework on people like Lyndon Johnson and Alan Dulles and James Jesus Angleton and some of these other guys, right? Th- this is what comes up. Sociopath, mm-hmm. elitist, definitely elitist. In some cases, bipolar. Okay. Who is uh, bipolar in your, in your narcissistic? Uh, Lyndon Johnson had the same symptoms as Abraham Lincoln from the standpoint he'd be manic and then he'd spend weeks in bed. Couldn't get out of bed. Oh, wow. And Phil Nilsson has written, I interviewed him and he's oh. written some book, really good books about Lyndon Johnson, but Johnson, he was just, and, and how we live in a society that almost rewards people who are sociopaths, Sure. Egomaniacs, <laughs> what, CEOs. There's a large percentage of not. A, there is a certain percentage that's more than people think of CEOs who are bipolar. And I had to write a story about this years ago. That's how I know this. And I actually was going to write a book about this C, bi- bipolar CEO. Um, we see that you know Ted Turner, he's bipolar, but that's just yeah. one example. But yeah. because they're manic, and when you're manic, you, you don't sleep. You can accomplish anything. You, you, you're doing the work of five people when you're manic. Well, I would say that's not the- unique to modern Western society. I mean, there's a lot of things that are wrong with our world, but uh, that type of personality, you go back uh, the, you know, the Soviet regime, Lenin, Trotsky, Stalin, they, they all had their psychological issues. You go back in history to all the conquerors of the past and they were, I think they all probably had very similar qualities, megalomania. I mean, Genghis Khan to Julius Caesar to, you know, any, any of the others that one could think of in the past, they, probably all shared some of those lovely qualities that you're. Yes. I mean, they were all megalomaniacs. You're right about that. But see, but, but see, here's the thing. And here's what I wanted to accomplish in the book. I wanted people to understand this. I wanted people to think that way about it, because when you think about it from that perspective, it gives you a better understanding of why Kennedy was killed. Okay. Let's get into that because I, this is to me where it really is what it's all about. Why? Was Kennedy killed? And do you have an opinion on who did it and all of that stuff? I'd love to hear. Yeah, well, I'll give you my opinion. And again, I'll do that last. But and I, mm-hmm. I want to a preface by saying I don't know for sure. I'm just basing this on my critical thinking skills and the research I've done. That's it. Fair and enough. the people I've spoken to. Um, Because I don't even think that you just no one can really know unless you were there. So and uh, the, most of those people are dead. So fair enough. Um, <laughs> so Kennedy. When people ask me who killed Kennedy, I say the Cold War killed Kennedy. I say the Cold War and its cold warriors killed Kennedy. And they're like, oh, you know, I I never thought of it that way. You know what I'm talking about. (laughs) But but just to, uh, I'll embellish a little on that. It's like Mick Jagger and uh, Sympathy for the Devil. I shouted out who killed the Kennedys and after all, it was you and me. It was you and me, right? It was like, it was the times. It was the times in which he governed that killed him. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is he stepped into a viper's den when he was elected. Yeah, totally. And I don't take some of the blame, not blame, because he was murdered and and, and Bobby was too, but they brought on some of this themselves because you remember he was elected. The mob did help him get elected. That's right. And then they turned around and Bobby went after the mob. Well, that's stupid. (laughs) <laughs> you know, and that's part of that ego, you know, they were, they had their egos too. And I say, and the Kennedy was not a perfect person, but what you learn about Kennedy is he went from a shallow man over the course of his life into more of a man of substance at the end mm-hmm. and someone who would, who would stand up for peace when he knew he was going against some very powerful people. Yeah. So you have Kennedy height of the, height of the, just about to be the height of the cold war. What's going to happen right away? Cuban Missile Crisis. Right away, like a, a year into his mm-hmm. presidency, that was one of the most defining moments in our in the world history. We could none of us could be here right now if that went the other way. Yeah, he kind of realized that he was surrounded by a bunch of crazy people in the Joint Chiefs. Like these guys Correct. are willing to have a nuclear exchange with the Russians. Correct. Yeah. And then Bay of Pigs, in which he learned right. Alan Dulles, head of the CIA, out outright lied to him, set him up to have to support it 
Otherwise, he'd look weak. And Kennedy's like, nope, I'm not supporting it. It right. pissed a lot of people yeah, off. Exactly. <laughs> Cuban mili militants, people like David Ferry and all those people in New Orleans that were in those camps training. So right? if, we can, if we can use the phrase deep state, I think it's really appropriate here with Kennedy. I think he put himself uh, at odds or at war with uh, these operatives, these deep state intelligence community operatives. Do, do, you, do you agree with that? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that took, you know, talk about profiles and courage. That took mm -hmm. a lot of courage because, and I think he miss. I, I don't think he thought he would be killed. I, I don't think he thought they'd have the gall to do that. Like to, to literally go through with something like that. And that's where he was mistaken. But the thing is, so he fires yeah. Alan Dulles, right? right? So he fires Alan Dulles and Alan Dulles had his group at the CIA. Alan yes. Dulles, and, and you know all this, uh, but for the for the sake of the audience, so Alan Dulles is OSS after World War II, C, when it turns into the CIA. Alan Dulles is one of the masterminds behind Operation Paperclip. He's helping get the Nazis, Nazis, might mm -hmm. I add, because what you find out is a lot of the elites in this country over the years, the Blue Bloods, eh, they kind of like the Nazis. <laughs> I mean, to it was Scott Bush. <laughs> I mean, and, uh, well, I say it like things. that as a joke, but it's not funny. They were anti-Semitic. <laughs> they were they hated everyone, and they uh, thought everyone was lesser than them. And, and they kind of liked the way the fascists operated. They were unrepentant Nazis as well. Like these, they, it's not like they had gone through some re-education, feel-good sessions before they came over to the U.S. I mean. American intelligence wanted these guys. Actually, to be fair, and I'm not defending this at all, but uh, you know, you had the Nazi intelligence guys, like former Obvair guys, and then you had the Nazi scientists, right? And they were coveted. Uh, the Russians wanted them, the Americans wanted them, other nations wanted them as well. And so you had this uh, very uh, delicate issue of, uh, well, we just were fighting against these guys, and yeah, they weren't really nice about the Jews, were they? Uh, what do we do about that? <laughs> Maybe we'll just. Uh, paper over the whole thing and hide it and never, no one will ever know. I right. think that's what and, it was, right? And, and you hear about Werner von Braun because I think with von Braun, oh, it's the space race. So like you say with the scientists, a little yeah. different. They might have been members of the Nazi party, but they were scientists, so whatever. But there's more than that. They were part of the network of getting them out, getting Nazi war criminals out of Germany. That's right through wherever they were going to go to Argentina. Yeah. And a lot of them were, wound up working at Detroit, in Detroit at factories, car factories that they found out 40 years later that this guy, the whole time he was working there, he was one of the guys that was in the, he was a guard at a concentration camp. It was, it was yeah. just a documentary on that. Yeah. But point is this, and this is what people need to realize because if they don't realize this, they're not going to get the Kennedy assassination. You have to understand people like Alan Dulles, John Foster Dulles, Prescott Bush, George H.W. Bush, Jesus Angleton. I mean, I can go on and on with these guys. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They recruited. So, and Alan Dulles recruited specifically from Ivy League schools, blue blood elitists to be in the CIA. Now, granted that especially back then at that point that you used to be really smart to graduate. I mean, obviously they were smart guys. I'm not taking that away from anyone. Yeah, right. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Many of them were brilliant in their own sick way. I'll, I'll, I'll put it that way, but this was their world. And, and as defining an elitist, cause I think I do that too in the book. I'm pretty sure I do, but I have since looked it up. The elitist attitude is we were meant to rule. And everyone in the world is better off that we're ruling them because we're the only ones who are capable of doing it correctly. Totally. If, <laughs> and that captures it very well. You know, very and accurate. if you don't understand these little nuances, and they're not little nuances, but when you're looking at the Kennedy assassination, here's Kennedy, right? And he's like, well, I, we can't, the Vietnam War is wrong. And we can't, we got to kind of chill with Cuba. You know, I'm going to get with Khrushchev and we're going to figure this out, right? We're going to, the nuclear missiles, you know, the things Kennedy did, especially in the last year up leading up to the assassination must have been infuriating these guys. And at some point 
in an office or somewhere. <laughs> I don't know where. A couple guys sat down, and I'm talking mm -hmm. about very powerful people. Think, think on the level of Rockefeller. That's right. We got to get rid of this guy. Mm -hmm. I will think Johnson Kennedy, play ball? Johnson will play ball. I, I, that's the thing. I, for years, I used to think, well, why would Kennedy have been killed? But when you when you think about it, I, I've often likened it to uh, the Agatha Christie murder mystery, uh, Murder on the Orient Express, in which <laughs> everyone did it. On yes. that one, every because everyone wanted this guy dead. and And that's with Kennedy. He was an enemy on multiple levels here. So with the Oliver Stone concept, it was, a lot of it was over Vietnam. I think that's where he really ties that in. You mentioned the mafia. I remembered reading the book Double Cross years ago uh, about Sam Giancana, the Chicago uh, mafia leader. Uh, one of the authors was his younger brother. And uh, in that one, they bring out the, the mafia connections, big time mafia connections that the Kennedys had, of course, uh, with um, the Chicago mafia in particular and how the, once Bobby becomes attorney general, he starts prosecuting them and they're like, we've been double crossed. We got to get those Kennedy boys. Mm -hmm. So that was, there's that motivation, but then you've got, uh, Kennedy is uh, go taking on the federal reserve in 1963. He's issuing yeah. non-federal reserve money in June of 1963, a couple of bill, I think $4 billion worth which was uh, like an opening salvo right there. That's huge. And then you've then there's the UFO thing. And you know a lot of Kennedy researchers are they run in terror of UFO connections. But I think today uh, that's very foolish. I think <clears throat> that needs to be understood. And there um, there are documents that Kennedy wrote. Uh, I think November 11th, 1963, just 11 days before he was killed. It's a, it's a legit UFO document, and he's instructing the CIA to cooperate with the Soviet Union on identifying UFOs. Uh, I don't think that would have gone over well. Uh, so I think Kennedy, I think the problem with Kennedy is that he showed that he believed he was the guy in charge. I think that was the problem. Like he believed he was the president is the one who makes the decisions. And they're like, oh, no, you didn't. That's not right. going to happen. Yeah. Hubris. I mean, that takes hubris because again, it, it, here's the difference. And yes, they were an elite family that people talk mm -hmm. about the Kennedys, but they weren't from the standpoint of, first of all, they were Catholic. Yeah. Another uh, their problem. father was, their father was a bootlegger. Right. I anyway, mean, you're talking about people back then. When, when I say elitist, I say coming off the Mayflower waspy, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, yeah, yeah. Ivy league educated. And you're at, you know, skull and bones, and, and skull and bones exist. So that's not a conspiracy. I mean, that's a real thing. But it's the it's it's an elitist club. Totally. It, yeah. and, and I don't know exactly what happens there. I don't think they're killing women in that thing. <laughs> but but it's an elitist mentality. And, and the, the Kennedys were come, like upstarts, right? They were upstarts. Yeah. So I, on the one hand, I, I you have John Kennedy and Robert Kennedy, and on the other, you have Alan Dulles and John Foster Dulles, two sets of brothers, right? So. And I got, I wanted to do it in the book where there were pictures side by side of the two brothers, mm -hmm. them here and them here, because that was, that's what we're talking about here. This represented one thing, this represented the other. The Kennedy brothers represented the possibility for a true Camelot future mm -hmm. in which, because Kennedy and Khrushchev became close at the end. They liked each other a lot and they became friends and they were like enough of this nonsense. You know, we need to make the world a better place. I mean, they they both realized the Cuban Missile Crisis, like, we're not going to win. Well, we're not going to win either. Yeah. No one wins. Why the Joint Chiefs of Staff thought they were going to win. So this is another thing. So the Joint, so they tell Kennedy about Operation Northwoods. Operation Northwoods, I think it was Angleton or one of these guys at the CIA came up with it, where there was a false flag. They it were was, it was a, um, out of the Joint Chiefs and it was Lemp. Lem um, uh, what the hell was his name? Lemnitz. Um, he was, uh, one of, I think he was either head of the joint chiefs or I think he was ahead of the joint chiefs. Probably. I'm sure he could collaborated with CIA on this, but, uh, yes. And he <laughs> came up with this. Actually, it was a wackadoo scheme that had a variety of, uh, possibilities here. Uh, one of which though was to hijack a U.S. airliner and, crash it into buildings right. in new york insane to think blame that. it on the cubans the right. blame it on the cubans and then we can invade cuba 
that's right. Sound a little familiar, this, people. And, and then Kennedy was like, there's no way you can like, do this. <laughs> it's like, because right. that would lead to nuke. They didn't care if it was nuclear war. They didn't, yeah. they were going to be in their bunkers. So they didn't care. And it's again, the elitist. Well, yeah, there's too many people anyway. Imagine, <laughs> no, like, so. <laughs> you go through, you, you've gone through, you get the Northwoods proposal and you're like, these people are certifiable. <laughs> so and then you, and you have the Cuban Missile Crisis a couple of months later, and they just prove the point that they are certifiable. And uh, and then they start up uh, uh, Operation Mongoose after the Bay of Pigs failed because they didn't want to give up on the Cuba thing. And what was that? They were like poisoning uh, exports of Cuba, sugar, I think, and they were blowing up schools inside Cuba. They were doing all this crazy stuff. And the, and the Kennedys learned about this and then had to shut that down. Could you just ma imagine how that had to be? Like what it's like to be John F. Kennedy and Bobby yeah. uh, dealing with this. It's not like they were these princes either. I mean, I, I think you're right. I think Kennedy had to go through a, a very long maturation process here. I mean, mm -hmm. there are a lot of things about him that were uh, sketchy from a personality point of view. But yeah. I think what's, what's clear is that he started to see, uh, I, I've been like, I am in the m midst of this pit. <laughs> of really dangerous people and how do i deal with that right and, and I then he starts dropping acid apparently with mary <laughs> meyer wife of <laughs> cia agent cord meyer right in the spring of 63 he's like he's like wow peace on that, earth man yeah exactly uh, that love triangle yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and so then, it's just incredible right right and you have that that's why that story that's a different conversation and yeah, i'd be yeah. glad to come on with peter by the way because oh, yeah, that yeah. is an incredible story that's, that's peter <laughs> and book. And it's a brilliant it, book it is brilliant it really book. is and it, yeah. and it all ties into this obviously but there's kennedy and you know how you show that they have those pictures when they see him and bobby and they have their heads in their hands and it's dark and they're just kind of like he's like what are they talking about well now you know what they're going through <laughs> you know it's you like... know what yes yeah i think that's probably right there you know uh, my uh co-author of, of of after disclosure with me is bryce zabel and he also had a great book on kennedy called surrounded by enemies and uh i think the title of that is quite apt you know surrounded by enemies and that was kennedy's situation i think he was yeah he definitely so, was. well in this segment I'm, we're doing two parts uh the second part's going to be on on uh, richard Olin members uh, for those people who are there but we've got uh like almost 10 minutes remaining for this segment and i so I would like to uh, ask you, what do you think about this? Uh, how understanding history may allow us to better understand the present time that we're in and, and maybe uh, predict the future. Yeah. And I this is perfect for you being an historian because I know you have an answer to this. But this is what I think. You are absolutely correct when you say this is an open wound. And a country can never heal itself unless that wound is closed. And, and the truth, that what that means is truth. The truth needs to come out. All that nonsense, all the cover-up, all that stuff, it's time. And we can never be that country, that same country again, until that's revealed. Mm. So, but history, I always felt if you're a student of history, you understand the why of things, not the what. The why. And if you understand the why, you automatically have a better understanding of human nature, why people do things. And that's when you get into what, what we just talked about, mm -hmm. the flaws in human nature, right? The, uh, to some extent, the mental illnesses that we suffer from that make us do ridiculous things, right? Mm -hmm. The societal norms and the, the, uh, indoctrination of societies and and nation on society of that indoctrination of the waving a flag that meant everything or killing the communists which you know communists had to die in the cold war that was all that mattered but when you, and you you also understand the the cyclical nature of history where you're repeating things over and over again because people aren't quite understanding what's happening and I, and, and you can predict the future. I can predict the future because now I, I feel, and people say, well, what do you think? What do you think? You know, you, you wrote this book. What do you think now with, in the situation we're in, what's going to happen? I'm just like, well, in 1860, there was a bloodletting. 600,000 people had to die. Mm -hmm. I said, I hate to be a downer, but I think there needs to be another bloodletting. I don't know if there's any way to get through this 
Oh yeah, just get my YouTube channel canceled. This is great. No, <laughs> no I don't mean to. I'm no, doing but, more than enough work on that. But, but, anyway, so but, but you know what I mean. It, it's yeah. it's it's understanding that here we go again. Yeah. Right. And if you understand the, the history, you're like, here we go again. It's well, happening how, again. How, how would you relate then the Kennedy assassination to? Because uh, I'd like you to explore that a little bit more, if you don't mind. So relate the Kennedy assassination to well to the current oh, so, to the current uh, you you know you talked about basically uh, here we are a nation on the brink of a a, a veritable civil war which I agree with you in many ways and right. levels uh, the, so how would you connect those two the Kennedy assassination I think secured power for elitists and 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 again elitists is is a, it's it's really mm -hmm. not a broad seems like a broad term but it's not because it's just a h very highest level of power right uh and and influence in this country and we see that with the large corporations with people you know it's like you never hear about you always we the american people through programs that manipulate and, and uh, psychologically and mm -hmm. propaganda are fighting each other as Democrats and Republicans, we hate each other. It's like it was the North and the South. This is it's almost the same thing, but mm -hmm. it's Democrat, conservative liberals. We are ready to tear each other's throats out. And if you don't think that the elites are sitting there dying laughing over all this because they're making record profits, right? They're still making, they're, they're, mm -hmm. we're still, you know, we're having our, whatever we're doing, you know, the, I say wars, you know, we've, Right now, we're not in a "quote unquote" war, war, but you know we've had wars almost consistently up until recently, th after Kennedy. So that the idea that I tell people this all the time: don't get caught up in Republican Democrat, don't get caught up in who's going to be president because none of it matters. Mm -hmm. You, Donald Trump, is insignificant. Whether you love him or hate him, he is an insignificant man. He's being used to divide us. And they're using his personality. Like it, to, to me, it's like, yeah, let that guy go run rampant. Why are the media is giving him? They gave him so much attention mm -hmm. and press time leading up to the 2020. Uh, can't, you know, and even, even in the uh, primaries. I mean, he wasn't. I mean, was, I thought Jeb Bush was going to be. We're going to have another Bush. <laughs> you know, and and well, yeah, that that was the pl the whole plan was uh, to have yeah, Jeb. But people have to remember with Trump, it wasn't just the Democrats who hated him; the Republican Party hated him. They did uh, because he they despised him, and he he uh, unbelievably just destroyed the a lot of the power base of that old Republican Party elite. People love to hate Trump. Of course, we watched the entire country lose its mind, uh, half the country while he was president. But I would just say. I mean, I'm going to say something radical, but I, I think Trump and Kennedy have a lot in common, to be honest with you. Uh, their personalities are different in so many ways. But what were they both? Both were uh, in their rhetoric and at times in policies. Um, uh, both put themselves at odds with that with that cabal. And um, I remember it was Chuck Schumer, uh, the first month that Trump was president. He's on Amy Goodman's Democracy Now! And she's interviewing him and he says, uh, you get the CIA mad at you. He's talking about Trump. He says, they'll find six ways till Sunday to take you down. And to me, the shocking thing was that Amy Goodman did not follow up with like, say what? Uh, because that would have gone against the whole narrative that the, the the liberals were saying is like, he's evil, he's evil. But no, he's actually, he, he was an enemy of the CIA and of the FBI. They hated him. And so the question is why? I'm just going to jump in and argue because I think what we are living in and have been for a little time is what I keep calling a global revolution. It is a global worldwide top down directed revolution. And it's not like Trump is the savior, but he was just, his rhetoric put him right in the path of some of those policies in terms of globalization and also the neocon wet dream of just, you know, regime changing every country that uh, didn't accord with the, the new system. So I think what we have in right now is much more globalist, revolutionary friendly. And um, and so the civil war is continuing. And I think that's really the that's the true um, ideological divide anymore. It's the old liberal, old conservative. Yeah, there's there's disagreements about that. But to me, the real divide, because I see a lot of uh, formerly old school leftists who are also taking on the anti-globalist. Uh, I've listened to Naomi Wolf. I mean, she's amazing. And I've 
I hear her talking to people like Steve Bannon, for God's sake. How does that happen? <laughs> well, this is how it happens. This is exactly why. So you have a lot of old school left and old school right. They are joining forces because they are seeing uh, this new power structure really impose itself. And I, I think what you're saying with Kennedy is like, Kennedy was um, kind of like, a, I, I don't know if we could say the elites didn't run things before him. I think they probably did. But I mm -hmm. would say with Kennedy, you get this, this um, pushing back on a lot of the big time agendas that they wanted. And that's why they had to take them out. And then I think you're exactly right. They consolidated a, a much more deep level of power as a result of that, which I think they've never let go. They've never let right. go. And they've said, they sent a message to every sitting president since then. Yeah. And uh, you know, let, let's not be afraid to go over our time a little bit here. Cause this is just really cool. I'm just <laughs> thinking, um, Relating to the to the UFO part of it, um, there are stories. Um, I've heard these rumors, like uh, whether it's Jimmy Carter or or Bill Clinton, uh, both of them. I think were like, I, if I step out of line, they're going to do a Kennedy on me. I, I and I've heard, is this true? I don't know, but I've heard rumors to that effect. Like you, you've, you got to be a team. Of course, Bill Clinton was, he was another Bilderberger. He was, he <laughs> right. was a buddy with George Bush senior, for God's sake. Like they, they were, they were like, there was, father no, and difference. Son, there was no political party there. I mean, None. it was just, it's just, a, yeah. The, the great movie, um, American made that starred Tom Cruise all about, uh, Eugene, um, Hassenfuss. No, uh, not Eugene Hassenfuss. I'm sorry. Barry seal. He played Barry seal, the CIA pilot who was dealing, uh, sending drugs up from Central America to the U.S. That was all through uh, Bill Clinton's Arkansas while uh, Reagan was in power. And it was overseen by George Herbert Walker Bush, Bill Clinton, bringing in cocaine by the ton into Arkansas. Like it was all one big, you know, big op. They all knew about it. So they were all part of the team. But but the idea of you get out of line and they'll do a JFK on you. Like I think that was always in the background. With these guys. I'll never forget this <clears throat> when Obama became president. So he wins the election and you know, they have that, well, it's transfer of power, but they have that meeting where they're all together. Right. So mm -hmm. you have Bush and his, and they have him, they go in and, and, and they come out. <clears throat> he, he was very confident Obama. You saw him in, in leading up to the election. He was a really confident guy as part of what got him elected. He was Dude's very, a rock star on the camera. Good, he knew it's how a to, good he knew speaker. How to do I mean, Absolutely. totally. Mm -hmm. He came out, I remember seeing on the news, him coming out of that meeting. And I, I remember turning to my wife and saying, he looks like he's shaken up. And I honestly thought he had more gray hair coming Wait, out of that meeting. And he went when? going into We're the in transition. Croatia? So no. So he becomes president. Oh, okay. And, and then there's supposed going. to be this meeting, like this thing. It, I don't think it happened with Trump because he refused to do it. But like with mm -hmm. Uh, so B Bush was there with mm -hmm. his people and then by, and then uh, Obama went in and it was like the, the fish in behind closed doors. There's a, like this meeting that occurs. Uh, and then they come out and talk about, Oh yeah, you know, we're all good and we're going to, you know, transition and da da da. But when he, I swear to God, he came out of this meeting and he was shaken up. Like they, it was almost as if they told him exactly what you just said. You, you, st you yeah. stir the pot too much and you yeah. were going to be Kennedy. They probably told him, <laughs> you know? uh, you're going to be the Goldman Sachs president. So you're going to bring all those guys on, which of course he did. That was the Goldman yeah. Sachs presidency. Yeah. And you're going to just bail out. Yeah. You're going to take that little baby and you're going to take care of that bailout baby. That's all. Yeah. And he must have been just floored. And then, mm -hmm. of course, George Bush Jr. was like, listen, my dad took out Kennedy. And I had no, so I know they're going to take you out if you do the same thing. <laughs> so, you know, I'm not saying, you know, that's uh, a little bit maybe, much, but yeah, I wouldn't doubt it either. But, uh, you know, it's, yeah, it's. All right, this is awesome. So I would like to continue this. And for people watching this on YouTube, look, I'm very sorry, but Jack and I are going to take this private. Hey, come to my website at Richard Olin Members, and we're going to, you can uh, check us out as we continue this. But for this uh, hour, I think this is a good place to uh, end this. But I just want to remind people of your uh, excellent book, Killing Kennedy, Exposing the Plot, the Cover-Up, and the con uh, Consequences, uh, with the forward by Cyril Wecht. I just wanted to say, what <laughs> a score. You get a living legend 
to write your forward. And this is the greatest forensic pathologist ever to talk about the Kennedy assassination. Fearless. He's got to be in his mid nineties. Yeah. It's got to be right. He's doing a conference in November in Dallas. Guy's a machine. He's incredible. And anyone who has not heard him speak on this is really, uh, it's, you're missing out because he's fearless and brilliant and just uh, incredible. So he wrote your forward, which is awesome. And, um, and oh, your website, by the way, you sent it to me. It's jackrothauthor.com. I'll have a link below uh, as well as to your books. So um, Correct. Well, Jack, what, yep. what, a one, what a wonderful, anything else you want to wrap up and just say before we uh, take this to the next section? No, I would just tell people, listen, you read the book, keep an open mind. And then afterwards, again, critical thinking skills, do your own research, talk to people, but don't forget about this event that happened almost 60 years ago, because we need to remember it if we're going to move forward in a positive way as a country. Yes. And, uh, you know, it's like a boil that needs to be lanced, uh, in a sense on the American body politic. I would say if we really want to Start having an Oz. Actually, here, you know what? Before we wrap this up, I would just say it's like I remember in, uh, what was it 2004? What was it? I think at ABC, I'm thinking Peter Jennings, if I'm not getting this wrong. They did something on Kennedy, uh, maybe 2003, because it might have been an anniversary. I can't remember, but it was just so ridiculously bad. And I, I remember thinking, what would it take? to get the truth out on the Kennedy assassination. Like what would it do? Uh, we, you mentioned briefly George Herbert Walker Bush. There are definite connections that he has with this, I think anyway. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a famous memo that went to J. Edgar Hoover about a George Bush of the CIA that apparently met with Hoover, uh, I think on November 24th, 1963. And that came out. Uh, Bush was vice president at the time. It was 1987, I think it came out. And uh, it was kind of an incendiary document, you know, because hell, this is like the vice president of the United States. Was he involved? And Bush's people said, no, no, that was a different George Bush. And then I remember uh, most of the journalists just left it at that, but one or two found the other George Bush, who was like this low level CIA guy. And, and they interviewed him and he said, are you kidding me? I never met with Hoover. That's like 10 <laughs> levels above my pay grade or something like that. And, <laughs> and so now you're left with, well, which George Bush was it? Well, I think it was our George Bush, you know, because you got a lot of connections here uh, with Zapata oil and yeah, Zapata uh, oil pigs and all it, so it like just, it, to expose all of that at any time, like that exposes the Bush family. And that's a no, no. So like, how long is it going to take? And then to expose the <laughs> real lies, then you're exposing deep criminality, deep criminality in the United States national security state. Like who the hell wants to get into that? They don't want to, they don't want to get into that. Right. I yeah. mean, it's just right. Because even though the people who may have pulled the trigger are dead and the people who planned it are dead, you're right. There's the bushes are still around. There's and it, and it would, would it erode American confidence that much more to say that it would just everything would fall apart. You know, I don't think it, that's why they keep their people get upset. Well, they're delaying these other documents coming out. Mm -hmm. They do that with the, uh, the UFO stuff too. Mm -hmm. And, but what I say to that is, do you think that whatever you are going to get <laughs> is going to be the Holy grail? They're not giving yeah. you anything they don't want to give you. So don't get too excited or upset about those documents <laughs> because yeah, they're just, <laughs> the the uh, if, official apologists will say, well, 99% have been left out. Yeah, but what if that's a really good 1%? First of all, of the documents that haven't been destroyed and they're never going to come out. But you got, there's a sliver. Why aren't they coming out, guys? <laughs> what about the, what if the 1% is really awesome? <laughs> that's funny. I love that. Yeah. yeah, it's, you know, listen, I don't, I don't know if we'll ever know the answers, but I think we always have to fight for the truth, if nothing else. And, and this is, this to me is my little contribution to it. Totally so. agree. And uh, I definitely recommend uh, everyone checking it out. I'm going to show it one more time here, Killing Kennedy, uh, great cover and it's a great book. So again, thank you for being on with me for this segment of the Richard Olin show, Jack Roth. Thanks Richard. 
And uh, that's all I'm going to have for this segment. I just want to thank everyone for being here with me for this hour. And uh, you'll see me again soon for another episode of the Richard Owens Show. But for now, let's uh, we'll take a, a quick break. And let's remember to keep fighting the good fight. Later, everyone.